Welcome, everybody. Um, we have John Smart here today, and we're going to be talking about his new book, Introduction to Foresight, Personal Team and Organizational Adaptiveness, and um, all sorts of things about technological progress as well. And John writes about foresight development, accelerating change evolution and evolutionary development, complex adaptive systems, big history, astrobiology, outer and inner space, human machine mergers, um, the future of artificial intelligence, neuroscience, mind uploading, cryonics and brain preservation, post-biological life and values of well-built networks. <laughs> He's a CEO of Foresight University, uh, founder of the Accelerating Studies Foundation and co-founder of the Evo Devo Universe Research Community and the Brain Preservation Foundation. He is editor of Evolution, Development and the Complexity uh, and Complexity. Um, he is also the author of The Transcension Hypothesis, the proposal that universal development guides leading adaptive networks into increasing phys physical, no, increasingly into physical and virtual inner space. Welcome, John Smart. It's great to have you again on the show. Adam, it's a, it's a real pleasure and honor. And that was a lot of stuff you just got through there. Well done, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, it's amazing. Oh, we did an interview um, in person when you were in Melbourne. I think it was in 2011. Yes, it was. 10 years ago. More than 10 years ago. <laughs> Time flies. When you're yeah, fun. it does. Yep. So, um, yeah, uh, do you want to um, show us the cover of your new book and uh, sure. give us a, an introduction on what that does, what, what you've written about there? Seven it's years in the writing. So this is a lot of work for us, at our little team at Foresight U, and uh, about uh, 300 pages of uh, really valuable tools for how individuals, teams, and organizations look to the future. Is it ready? Yes, it's on Amazon now, and I'm circulating uh, copies. If anyone would like a copy, uh, a digital copy, uh, email me, John Smart. J O H N S M A R T at gmail.com, and I'll send you an, an ebook uh, or a PDF version of it. But it's also available in print version, Dead Tree version on Amazon. So, uh, Introduction to Foresight. So, and it's written for uh, in two versions this is a version for executives and a version for students. Uh, so, those are the two main audiences. Um, students want a deep dive into foresight tools and executives want kind of more of a summary of you know, how can I use foresight for myself and um, my elevator pitch for what foresight is, is anything you do prior to strategy. If you don't do anything, if you just jump right into making strategy, then you're not doing foresight. But if instead you first start looking for major trends, you start uh, thinking of key uncertainties, maybe you do um, argument mapping, bet mapping, maybe you do um, scenario construction around major uncertainties. Uh, maybe you even create a prediction market where people are going to compete with their insights for what they think is coming. Um, that's all foresight. And that field's been around for 50 years. Uh, it's, it's a major field. Uh, there's Three places in North America, you can get a master's or a PhD in it. I got my master's from the University of Houston, the oldest of the 22 places around the world where you can get a degree in strategic foresight. So that's what strategic foresight is. It's very valuable. In the process of writing my book, though, I discovered all of the psychology of foresight. That's, that's a new field. Uh, it's happening uh, in psychology itself. And I'm going to give you an overview in our talk today about some of the findings from the psychology of foresight, how we can think better about the future. And then I've got a second brief, which is called How Technology is Changing the World, um, that I did recently, uh, end of last year. And we'll dip into that for some ideas on uh, accelerating change. Um, the, the world that we're going, that we're living in, I think the last talk we did, Adam, was around why things are gonna to continue to go faster. And of course, we did that talk just after the iPhone had emerged. And now we're in this world that's been recreated by cloud and mobile and where 
the number of companies that are worth a billion dollars are now in the thousands. Just two or three years ago, uh, sorry, just a decade ago, uh, they were so rare that they were called unicorns, right? Mm-hmm. The world is just accelerating in certain very key ways, and it's going to continue to do that um, as a number of the futurists uh, and uh, for, forecasters and foresighters on your channel have discussed because the physics of the universe seem to allow this acceleration. We live in this very interesting universe where when we go further into miniaturized domains, it just becomes easier and easier to generate information, computation, and intelligence, right? And adaptiveness. And that's going to continue as far as we can see into, you know, uh, the physics of, of uh, future computing devices. Uh, quantum computers, of course, uh, have blown up since we had our last chat. Mm-hmm. And now uh, we have people racing for quantum supremacy in various algorithms. Uh, and we can see a world where the ability to use more advanced quantum computing is going to lay bare all the gene protein regulatory networks, all the mysteries of how we self-organized, right? Over many past cycles. And there's now a new field called Evodevo biology that really tries to understand human beings and all living systems as evolutionary and developmental systems. Uh, evolutionary systems in the sense that they're constantly varying and experimenting and becoming something different and developmental systems in the sense that they're continually predictably cycling through birth, growth, death, reproduction, and then uh, another system emerges, right? And that's a developmental process and it's predictable and it's hierarchical and it's the real opposite if you think about it of the evolutionary processes that create incredible variation Um, in, in our own genome we can point to processes we have sex we have retroviral uh uh, insertion sequences 10 percent of our genome is actually um viruses having sex with us inserting new genes, right? And that's been happening since the whole history of, of, of life, right? So DNA is this thing that loves to replicate and explore unpredictably, creating new combinatorial possibilities. And that those are all evolutionary processes. And I like to use that idea of adaptive radiation that we find when something comes to a new niche to think about graphically, to think about an evolutionary process. Developmental process is the exact opposite. It takes the chaos out of a system and it hits a future target. And so the developmental genetic toolkit, right? The the, the set of developmental genes that make us predictable, they're, they're fighting that sexual reproduction, mutation, viral insertion, transposons. They're fighting these processes that create variety. And we need both in a complex Evodevo system. We need these variety creating and we need these um, um, convergence processes, right? We need divergence and convergence. And so I have this strong belief that uh, the advances we've seen in deep learning recently, uh, where we've port, you know, since our last conversation, uh, it was actually in 2010 and 2011 that um, a deep learning processes started to outcompete um, the um, processes that um, the, the engineered approaches to AI. And so I, and, and so I have this strong belief that uh, the future of AI is going to have to be more like that. It's going to have to be deeply biomimicry uh, based and biologically inspired. Um, and so that's my kind of 
overview of how I see the future of AI is that there are the developmentally, there's a bottleneck. We're going to have to go to that kind of, to an AI that has a scent, that, that has feelings, that has empathy, that has um, you know, the lim- kind of limbic circuits that we have. And it's going to, ha- it's going to have to be a community of AIs under selection, replicating under selection, um, just like us, just like uh, we do. So that's my kind of overview of my belief about the future is that technology, this is also called the merger hypothesis, you know, that humans and machines get more intimately connected in the future. So that's my summary of uh, the assumptions that I take to the uh, regarding the future. And so um, maybe now would be a good time for me to jump into the slides uh, that kind of overview my book, if that sounds good to you, Adam. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, that okay. sounds like a great idea. Do you know All how right. to uh, share yep. the screen? Yes, I do. I'm okay. going to just do that right now. And how does that look? Fantastic. Looks great. great. Okay, so before we talk again about this accelerating change and all the things we talked about in our last uh, podcast uh, 10 years ago, uh, I'm going to give you an overview of my book. And it's, like I said, it's called Introduction to Foresight. And there's some really powerful things here for individuals, teams, and organizations. And maybe the first thing that I should do is give you a quick summary of who I am. Um, I'm an educator, uh, an entrepreneur, um, sold a company uh, to um, in science tutoring and test preparation to a company called Princeton Review. And then as my second career, I decided foresight was what I really cared about. I really care about how people look to and analyze the future. And as I got deeper into that, I got attracted to complex adaptive systems and how they work. And that led me to this evolutionary developmental or evo-devo biology and philosophy to help me really understand these two processes that are uh, uh, central to adaptiveness in living systems. I have a bachelor's from the Haas School uh, at UC Berkeley in business. Then I got my master's in strategic foresight from the Houston program, as I was saying in my opening. Um, And then I got a a second master's in physiology and medicine from the uh, UCSD medical school. And then uh, I started this community, this Evo Devo universe complexity research community uh, in 2008. We've had uh, two conferences since since and produced two technical books. Uh, Our second book, is here on the slide. It's um, uh, a Springer volume that has a bunch of different uh, academics talking about these three things, evolutionary processes, developmental processes, and complexity, which we like to think of as the intersection of those two. Um, And I also started this nonprofit called the Acceleration Studies Foundation, uh, which we talked about in our last podcast, which is this question of why do things go faster and what things do go faster over time? Many things don't, but as we all know, computation, communication, nanotechnology, uh, and also anything that virtualizes like the, um, the growth of economics, right? Economics has become, or sorry, the growth of economies. Uh, Money is a, as a highly virtual and abstract, um, um, value keeping system that we use. So as if information, if I can convince you that information is going to accelerate and that computation is going to accelerate, I can probably convince you that um, the virtualization of value in the forms of record keeping like money, that's gonna continue to accelerate too. And so this gets to the interesting question, Adam, of is, is, is human populations saturate? Uh, as the to- total global human population hits, say, uh, uh, 10 billion mid-century or a little after, does that mean economic 
growth has to saturate. Well, a great futurist called Herman Kahn, uh, who did a lot of work uh, at the Hudson Institute and wrote about uh, uh, thermonuclear war in the 50s and 60s, he believed that uh, economic growth was going to saturate when human population saturated. But I think what we've discovered since is that um, intangibles, the intangible value of everything that we produce in goods and services, that keeps accelerating. So even as human populations saturate, the number of technological uh, productive systems and then eventually technological minds, if you will, uh, those are gonna continue to accelerate. So the kind of economic growth that we're seeing now, you know, the, the 12% annual leading returns that we're seeing on the stock market. Some people think that that's, uh, you know, that, that can't be sustained. And I would argue that, that it will, that we're going to see, see even more of that kind of growth and the percentage, you know, the compound annual growth rates are going to keep ticking up even higher. Now, maybe it's short, that could be short run, you know, booms and busts as always, but the, the larger trend um, accelerates. So, uh, that I think we will come, we'll circle back to that later when we get into our Q and A, but that's my little overview of, of, uh, kind of what acceleration is to me. Um, okay. So I have these two books and you can find a uh, draft PDF at foresightu.com slash books of the first one as well. Um, like I said, you can email me or uh, you can just go to that link and get them. And then this the second book is about societal, global and universal processes of change. And that's book two of the Foresight Guide. And, and I'm planning to get that out um, uh, later this year. Okay. So one thing we can say about Foresight that's very basic is that uh, there are these six domains of practice. There's our personal foresight, how we look ahead. There's team foresight. And that has everything to do with you know, family and relationships, anything outside of ourselves that's uh, relationship-based. Then there's organizational foresight. And that's the, the kinds of things that we normally think of when we think of how companies look ahead and the traditional strategic foresight, the tools that we were talking about earlier, trends and scenarios and intelligence. Then there's societal foresight, and this is the kind of stuff, and global foresight. And those two domains are the kinds of things that we talk about on Reddit futurology. You know, we love to debate, you know, where's that world going? Where, where's our country going? Where's the world going? And then there's universal foresight, which was, I was talking a lot about in my opening. And that's, that's the part that I really went deep into when we started the Abu Dhabi Universe community. You know, what does science and philosophy and complex systems thinking tell us? about what's coming. And like I said, one of the really unique things is this accelerating change. We live in a universe where things, can, certain special things can continue to accelerate. And so they're really, they're really important to, to uh, you know, keep in mind, right? Another basic thing about the psychology of foresight that we should all understand is that um, most of our future thinking is very short term. It's between now and every, now and the end of day. In fact, it's the next few seconds to minutes. And there's a model in my book called the predictive processing model of uh, uh, psychology and neuroscience. And the, the PP or predictive processing model gives a lot of evidence for how our brains are unconsciously organized to predict things. And if we make that more conscious and we actually consciously ask, what do I expect to happen over the next you know, few minutes, next few day, uh, or sorry, next few hours, and we make lists and we prioritize, and then we pay attention to where we are relative to those lists and we keep coming back to them and, and to review them, that's all today's foresight. And one of the things that we learn from the psychology literature is if we get better at that, we get much better at planning for the next day, for tomorrow, and then for the next week. And tomorrow to the next three months is called short-term foresight. And then midterm foresight is the next quarter to the next four years. 
okay, the fours, if you will. The T's is short term, tomorrow to three months, right? Qu the, uh, you know, up to a quarter. And then we occasionally think past four years, say the next election cycle, and that's called long-term foresight or what, we, what we'll often do on, uh, on your um, podcast, Adam, you know, the next 20 years, the next 50 years, the future of AI, the future of the world, right? And so this is a power law. This is the power law of future thinking. And that means, that means we spend power law less time the further out we go on this curve uh, thinking. And one of the key insights is that if we get better at today's foresight, we can get much better at the short to midterm, which is where most of us are evaluated in organizational and team settings. Most of us are not evaluated on our long-term thinking ability. It's not, it's not a high value thing in society. It's something we love, it's important, but. And what I have learned is if you really think about how you wanna get a really good long-term foresight study done, you don't give it to a long-term thinker like many of the folks who, who um, you know, on Reddit who love just looking away long-term. You give it to a person who's good at today's foresight. And if they can't think well in the longer term, they know how to find the people who do and then get them into a cognitively diverse uh, group, interacting, record that, put that PDF up and you get a really great foresight product. So you have to have a lot of these, they're often called presentists rather than futurists. A person who's very good at today's foresight is very good at navigating now to next, what's happening now, what's gonna happen in the next few hours. You have to have a person like that, a short-term foresighter and a, a today's foresighter on your team if you wanna get good long-term and midterm foresight. So that's one of the big insights I think that's worth recognizing here. In 1970, we got a book, Future Shock, which talked about accelerating change as a societal process, a very important one, and that it was psychologically causing a lot of stress. And this book was a massive bestseller. It sold 6 million copies, if I recall. And I met Toffler before he died, had two interviews with him. And we, we tried to think, like, why do so few people pay attention to this thing, this accelerating change? And, and how do we get people to realize how important it is to, to try and anticipate it better and guide it better? And um, the main model that I think we need to use to do that is this evolutionary development or what Toffler called the three Ps. We have to think about the probable, the possible, and the preferable. And the preferable is an intersection of the possible and the probable. To understand it from in physical terms, you have a whole series of, of physical processes that are statistically probable, like classical mechanics, thermodynamics. And then you have the series of processes that are not, like quantum mechanics and chaos. And those two somehow conspired to create organisms that have preferences, us, life, intelligence. And that happened over a few billion years in the universe's evolutionary development, right? So this model is a very basic model of how uh, change happens. And I have a link here to an article that goes more into that, uh, if you'd like more. Organizationally, how does this play out? Well, what it, what we, what we find in organizations is we got people in forecasting or finance or risk management or law or security. These people are very developmental or funnel oriented and they're past oriented too. They, they, they look at the past, they see the trends and they're looking for probabilities and they think in terms of probabilities and predictabilities. Uh, you know, folks who are into causal modeling, like we were describing, like we were talking about before our, uh, the podcast started, uh, um, Judea Pearl and all, you know, anybody who's doing something very statistical and predictable, um, uh, rational, they're going to be on the probability side. They're trying to understand certainties. They're trying to build frameworks that constrain, constrain the future, right? Then on the possible side, you have people that are, they're maybe not so much concerned with the, with the framework that the universe operates under. They're actually looking at what kind of, what are the combinatorials and dynamics, what kind of things could happen. 
And people on your organization who think this way, uh, you know, they're not funnel oriented, they're kind of tree oriented, like Darwin's tree of life. They're just looking at new things they can try, throw out there and see what sticks. You know, um, if the probable is a more scientific framework, the possible is a more artistic framework, right? Or, or entrepreneurial framework. So people in your teams who are in doing innovation or ideation or knowledge management or design, all your entrepreneurs, you know, they're trying to create the future rather than predict the future. If you've ever heard that phrase, right? Uh, there's also in the foresight space, the people who are futures oriented with an S and people who are future oriented. They want to know what the big constraining future is. So that's another basic conflict between the probability and the possibility oriented people. And then sitting above those, bridging them in Curtin's term, the bridgers are the folks who are trying to do analysis or planning or strategy or leadership. And, you know, they're working in uncertain domains with, you know, complex problems and no, there's no optimization available. The folks who are doing optimization are down on the probable side and you can't optimize most things in life because we have fine, we're organisms with finite computation facing astronomical combinatorial explosions of possibilities in our universe. And so, you know, the bridgers, the people at the top who are trying to figure out what do we, what do we want to do next? What's our priorities? What are our preferences, our strategies? Those folks, they're trying to bridge this possible and probable way of thinking. And they, they try and see landscapes, adaptive landscapes, right? That's a good metaphor for how they think uh, graphically. They're looking at, let's say they're looking at the future strategy for their company. They've got peaks on that. They, they've got a couple of selective variables on their um, X, Y axis and, the, and on their Z. They've, they're looking for peaks of adaptiveness. Either other competitors are on. And they're also looking for valleys of maladaptiveness and you know who's losing on the landscape and can I buy them up or and who do I want to cooperate with and who do I want to compete with so that's a that's a very helpful I think very basic this is again this is Toffler's model um, from a complex systems from our Evo Devo complex system perspective that uh, today is still a very strongly used model in foresight now we have to add to this something basic I talked about the preferable future. Well, it turns out there's two sentiments that we use to prefer the future. There's strategic optimism and defensive pessimism because all organisms are pleasure and pain motor motivated, motivated to move towards something that's supporting them and move away from something that might be harming them. We constantly have arguments in our you know, limbic systems about things that we might want and possible positive futures and negative things that we want to prevent. So, and then, so that we're all optimists and pessimists and realists in, in Dilip Jest, his book here, Wiser, has a very nice summary of it. Um, realists are balancers. A realist is not someone who's like a situational ethics or real politic person, uh, cynical realism. Sometimes you hear that term. That's a, one of the connotations of the word. In this psychological uh, uh, model I'm giving you, realism is someone who looks at the glass and their mind flips between half full, half empty, half full, half empty. They're a person who can see both, right? They can see both perspectives. And they're both very valuable. Um, and it's good to ask, where are you most of the time? I think, Adam, you and I tend to be technological optimists, maybe long-term optimists too. But we're both pessimists on certain things too. And it's good to know where you are a defensive pessimist. And it's very valuable to be a defensive pessimist. They actually live 10% longer than strategic optimists. And yeah, they do so. Yeah. And they probably because they kind of, they don't burn the candle at both ends. You know, they have better, you know, better, maybe better health insurance. I mean, it's hard to say what all the reasons are, but um, you know, there was an interesting study from you know, like five years ago that uh, made that made that uh, claim. I guess now by saying defensive pessimism, you're not talking about people who are racked with like uh, anxiety and are really depressed about Let, the world. Let's explain that. So Dilip set talk. Dilip differentiates defensive pessimism and explanatory pessimism. What you just described is explanatory pessimism. Someone who 
looks at the world and explains the, the interactions from a pessimistic lens consistently. And that is toxic. Those people who do that, you know, they have heart attacks earlier. They have more stress. So there is evidence that that is maladaptive to individuals. And of course, it's maladaptive from an adaptive standpoint, too. Um, as we get older, we all get a little more of that. Some people get a lot more of that, but most of, but most of us do not, as he describes in Wiser. He's, a, he's, a, he's an aging and neuroscience researcher at UC San, San Diego, uh, Delete Jest. So yes, defensive pessimism, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, and I'm not going to do it now. We'll see more of what it is, Adam. This book by Gabrielle Ottingen came out in 2015, uh, Rethinking Positive Thinking. And she said, you know, she was trying to understand positive psychology, which has been around a little while now with Martin Seligman and such. And she said, well, defensive pessimism is important. Imagining failures and preventing them, that's an important kind of foresight. How do we do that better? And so she started working with students at University of New York, you know, NYU and University of Hamburg uh, in, uh, in Germany. And she did all kinds of randomized controls, controlled trials where she had people think optimistically and then make a plan, pessimistically make a plan, optimistically first, then pessimistically, then make a plan. And then uh, what she called reverse contrasting, pessimistically first, optimistically, and then make a plan. And these would be plans for how much work I'm going to get done today, how many, um, uh, how much, um, uh, you know, um, um, how high my score is going to be on a standardized test, um, whether I can make a behavior change, like eat more fruits and vegetables over the next three weeks or exercise more or lose weight. So she, co she, she covered a whole bunch of things. And she gives you all the data in this book. And what she found is that if you think first optimistically, Oh, that's a goal I want. Oh, if I get it, that's going to be great. Strategically, that's desirable. And then you spend the same amount of time thinking about all the ways you might not get that. And now you ask yourself, well, what are all the ways I've failed in the past? What are my setbacks? What are the, what are my, what are the habits that have kept me from reaching that kind of a goal before? Uh, what are the problems? Is the goal realistic, right? Then you make a plan. It's, it's called an if-then plan. If this problem comes up, then I'm going to do this to try and overcome it. And you can do this where you spend a minute optimistic, a minute pessimistic, a minute planning for something very short. Or you can do it where you spend an hour optimistic, an hour pessimistic, and an hour making a detailed plan. So it really doesn't matter the length of this process. You know, obviously, you'd spend a lot more for a big plan, like, let's say, trying to get a new job or, or something like that. But if you follow this process with a rough one-to-one -one ratio, where, where it's optimism first, you get 50 to 100% less prediction error, 30 to 50%, 150%, 30 to 150% more productivity on the plan, and greater motivation to overcome obstacles. And she didn't quantitate the third benefit very well. She also said you get less anxiety and regret, and that was not quantitated well either, so I didn't put that on the slide here. But the really good data is you really can anticipate now what you're going to get done, and you get a lot more done. And those are two very valuable things. Now, the interesting thing that she showed is that, you know, oh, and so then we developed at Foresight University a model that's better than SWOT. If you know what strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, yeah, this indeed. model, this model is also a positive, negative, positive, negative, just like SWOT. So it takes advantage of Ottingen, but of what she discovered. But we start external and go internal. SWOT does the reverse, starts internal, strengths, weaknesses, and then external opportunities, threats. What we argue is you, what you want to do if you're doing a plan, a task with your team, look first at the advantage that's happening externally, all the benefits, all the new tools, all the change that might potentially, all the benchmarks for good behavior that might potentially be useful to you. Then look at the disruptions that are happening. And those are forced changes. 
not necessarily negative. They're negative to some people, but not necessarily to you. COVID, of course, was negative to most of us, but huge benefits for certain companies and certain parties as a result of that disruption, right? And after you've looked at those two, then you look at your personal or team or organizational opportunity. And then finally, you look at risk or threat. And risk oh, yeah. is two types. Risk of action. Opportunity. And Great opportunity to motivate research into biotech, um, especially, you know, um, immu uh, immunization research and stuff like that. So I imagine having yes. that as a, as a, as a, um, I guess, a, a threat has motivated a lot of progress in biotech. I would, yeah, having it as a disruption has uh, created lots of individual internal opportunities for various actors. And it's also created a lot of risk for various actors, risk of action and risk of inaction. Our friend Max Moore talks about the proactionary principle, and that is, that is balanced against the precautionary principle. You've got risk of action and risk of inaction, and you really have to think about both, right? As Max would say, you will lose often uh, adaptiveness if you don't act, right? It seems safer. There's this bias to inaction but it's not if you really balance both, both risks. And so that's the basic idea, but here's the problem. We have negativity bias in our media in some of our organizations, teams, and some of our individuals. We think about the negative first and we shouldn't. That's your, back to your explanatory pessimism um, point, Adam, right? Is that's, that's damaging to us. We want only defensive pessimism. The, pest, the, kind of, the kind of imagining of the dystopias and the traps that could kill us or slow us way down. That's what we want. And we want it only relative to our opportunity. We don't want to be imagining all kinds of negatives that are, that are irrelevant. So that's called in our book, draw a bias, where we look first at external disruption and then risk. And we look at those two diffusely and they're not relative to us. And then finally, we get around to positive opportunity and advantage. And we don't think about advantage much because that's that causes envy, right? To see all the advantage that everyone's getting that we're not getting. Because advantage by definition is positive benefits others are getting, not us, right? That's what advantage is. It's positive benefits happening when you do a scan of the environment and on, on, in the world with the accelerating tools and progress happening, there's always somebody somewhere who's getting some new advantage that you're not getting. But of course, our media doesn't discuss that very much. That's the fourth thing in the, in the, um, if we're draw biased in the way we think, uh, because that doesn't grab eyeballs, right? What grabs eyeballs and keeps people uh, you know, glued to social media or or any 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 um, uh, made you know any uh, network news platform is disruption and risk. So we have to fight that. Ottingen has actually shown that when you reverse contrast and do the defensive pessimism, even though it's you're trying to be defensive, and then the optimism, that your foresight capacity, your foresight accuracy, goes down by half. So what you think you're going to get done the next hour, the next day, the next week, it's, you know, that model is half as accurate as the person who looks first at the positive, right? And then the negative. So we want to be ADOR focused rather than DROA focused, right? And what is ADOR? That's, you know, advantage, disruption, opportunity, risk, right? That's SWAT 2.0 in our model. And people who are that way, they see the big picture, they are self-determined, they have priorities, they're, they're asking themselves what their priorities are every time they run an ADAR analysis, which could be, again, that could be just five minutes that you do every day, right? As you're setting your, as you're setting your priorities uh, for the day. And they have realistic scenarios for the future. And this book here, Power of Bad, helps, you, helps our uh, audience understand how to use defensive pessimism well, right? And one of the things you do is you want to stop consuming network media because it's all negativity bias based and start consuming media that's more balanced between the positive and the negative. And maybe you want to consume a lot of those at your events in the, in the bigger world, maybe a few days late or a whole week late if you read a magazine like The Economist. 
and that you use that as your as your um, input source for what's going on in the bigger world. And many of us can do that, right? We don't have to we don't have to have uh, the majority of our media being uh, you know what's happening every day in a 24-hour news cycle. So we have this um, application of audience model that we call GRASP. And in the back of my book, I've got uh, an exercise you can do. Uh, it's just five minutes where you spend a, uh, you take one of the things you're going to do at the, the, uh, the end of this day, or, or sorry, during this day. Um, you pick your goal. It should be worthy, difficult, and short term. And then you think for a minute about how far you are from it and how would you measure progress. Then you think, put on your happy hat, you think about the advantages you will get if you get that goal. Then you think about the setbacks, you know, you put on your defensive pessimism hat and you think, well, how could I fail? And what are the real obstacles? Not the ones that seem obvious, but what are the real ones that maybe are hidden, right? What are my assumptions? What are the biases that I have that are keeping me from, uh, that, that are likely setbacks that I'm gonna have on stri striving for this goal? Then you make your plan and you have two things in it. What are the key resources that are gonna help me? And what are the if then conditions if an obstacle comes up and how do I get over it? And again, audience tested this in academic performance, relationships, behavior change and high stress work. She showed that doing this uh, grasp um, model, she, her version is called WHOOP, it's just a different acronym. Um, doing this model for, um, I believe it was two hours, caused two years of behavior change in um, diet and weight loss. That's in her book. So a two hour exercise doing this, like you might do in the morning when you're setting a plan or you're thinking about what I'm gonna do next, uh, caused a two year effect, right? Of increasing uh, eating of fruits and vegetables and, and, uh, and uh, some significant loss of weight. So these are hard things to do. Behavior change is a hard thing to do. You have to, you have to use sentiment to do it. So the new model I've now. Experimenting with intermittent fasting. So it does have. work. Yep. Wonderful. I have um, like, yep. you know, usually it's a day or I just miss out on two meals or I have a, a, a dinner early one day and then have dinner late the next day with no meals in between. Um, last year I was doing a lot of hits. So now I'm going to try and combine the two. And see how I Fantastic. Go. Fantastic. Yeah. You might like, um, the guy, um, who runs, um, primal, the primal endurance podcast by Brad Kearns. He's moved away from hits to, um, what he calls high intense, uh, high, um, high quality interval training rather than high intensity interval training. And the way he approaches it, Brad Kearns in uh, Primal Endurance is that you take enough time in recovering from your, in, your intervals to do as well on the next interval as you did on the first. In standard hits, each interval is going to get lower and lower. So let's say you run a, you know, you run a lap and then you take a few minutes to recover and then you run it again or a few seconds or like a half a minute or a minute to recover and you run it again. He says, no, he says, people don't stick to that schedule because it's very hard. So it's an obstacle is how hard it is. And he says, instead, take four minutes to recover and then run the next lap and four minutes to recover and run the next lap. And it, it, but Take as long as you need to do as well on the next one and then rack up your six intervals or whatever it is that you do. So these are really interesting things, right? And the same is true with intermittent fasting. There's a great book called The Fast Five Lifestyle by Brad Herring, the MD, The Fast Five Lifestyle. And there's a whole Fast Five community on uh, uh, Facebook. Uh, and they're all struggling with how I can I, how can I eat in a condensed eating window of five hours? That means I have to fight not eating for 19 hours. Okay. It's no problem when I'm sleeping, but what do I do the rest of the time? Right? No breakfast, no lunch or very late lunch. Right. 
Um, and it's full of all these great tools for, you know, if then conditions, if this happens and the key resources that I need, right? So, yeah. So bring this back to this model, um, what we're actually doing with GRASP and, and with uh, Foresight is we're anticipating, we're innovating, and those are external assessments. And then when we create strategy, we're, we're present oriented now and we're doing, we're putting on our, our optimistic hat and then our pessimistic hat and we're balancing the two and then we're making a plan. And this is called, the bottom of this pyramid is called predictive contrasting, the future and futures debates that we were talking about early. And then the top of it is called sentiment contrasting. So you start with predictive and then you move to sentiment. And in, in, in our society, most people don't care about predictive contrasting. They forget how important it is. But you have to do that before, well, before you get to good sentiment contrasting. If you haven't really stopped to think about what's probable and what's possible, you can't really assess very well what your priorities, plans, and next action should be. So this is the four Ps model. Art Shostak gave it to us in 2001. Probable, possible, preferable, and preventable, right? You really, really want to think about, you don't want to just think about preferable. You want to think about what you want to prevent. And we can ask ourselves how we're doing and is our team doing well with it? Now, in an organization, like the, the folks that I uh, consult with in you know, my, my corporate work, you've got your anticipators, your innovators, your optimists and your pessimists, right? And there's a really, in my, in my book, there's a nice assessment you can do. Uh, to, to, in every organization, a certain percentage of people are defensive pessimists. They think first about what to prevent and then second about what they want. And then there's another significant percentage that are optimists. And then likewise, at the bottom, there's innovators and there's anticipators. And these guys all have to get along. These are all the conflict groups. Now, the interesting thing, and I'm just going to briefly mention this, is if you have trusted um, conflict in your group, what's what Amy Edmondson at Harvard, Harvard calls psychological safety, and here's her book, The Fearless Organization, it's got all the data, you get more conflict and better performance, both, because it's trusted conflict. Does that make sense? If you have all four of those groups conflicting with each other, but in a trust setting, and everyone has psychological safety for talking about what they care about, that means the pessimists are allowed to say their, their fears without getting attacked. The optimists are allowed to say their, their hopes without getting attacked. The predictors are allowed to predict without getting laughed at. Oh, you can't predict that. That trend, you don't know how long, that trend can't, it's not going to last. And the possibility thinkers are allowed to throw out their, their you know, interesting scenarios without getting attacked. You get higher conflict and higher performance. Okay. And that's really what this uh, Goldberg Urey curve is showing here. Uh, and so you want to get to this upper right corner of the, and there's a, there's a conflict mode test you, assessment you can do called the TKI. It'll tell you which of these five types of, of uh, conflict managers you are. And you want to try and get in the, to the upper right corner on this. This is a developmental um, assessment. You want to be a collaborator finding the win-win solution between all, all of these groups that are conflicting, right? And so psych safety is the fundamental thing. Uh, my wife at Google did a, uh, was part of a, a team that studied uh, like 100,000 employees at Google to find which teams were the high performing teams and what were their key features. And they found that um, psychological safety was the fundamental thing, right? You want to, it's got to be safe to express conflicting ideas. You want to root out ridicule, sarcasm, snark, and anticipate and, and intimidation. You want to reward new ideas and if, you, if a mistake happens, you want to get somebody to own it, correct it, praise the corrective action, and move on, right? Don't dwell on the mistake. You just own it, praise it, praise the corrective, and move on. So, you know, her team was part of the team that reported this study in something called a rework, which you can find on, uh, on Google's rework website still, right? This is a big, big study that shows how important psych safety is. There's also a, an assessment, say? 
Just, that's, that's fascinating and, and I totally agree it's it's uh <laughs> there's a lot of culture out there in organizations where people don't want to speak up and don't want to talk about the architecture getting too complex or something some process being broken because they don't want to be in fear of retribution from the people higher up because they think that the higher ups cherish their organization and don't want to be told about the flaws yeah, and it really reduces the opportunity uh, for learning for the group, right? When you can't do that. So uh, um, people don't give emotional trust easily. And, you, and emotions, sentiment is the more powerful. Um, we, we, we are thinkers first, feeler, uh, or feelers first, thinkers second, right? That's the dual process model of Danny Kahneman, right? System one is fast and strong and system two is weak and and secondary and so you really have to get that emotional trust and then you get the cognitive trust and psych safety allows you to do that and this is really nice assessment called the curtain uh, assessment kai and it actually sorts you into uh it's a very short test you can take um that will sort you on a normal curve between the folks who are probability oriented, possibility oriented, and then the folks that are bridgers, uh, they they think they the, they think about the preferable and the preventable, and the, and they're actually the middle of that normal curve, right? It's a bridger. So you're going to have a certain number of innovators and a certain number of anticipators, but most people are going to be in the sentiment conflicting space, the optimism pessimism conflict that Ottingen was studying. That's the majority where the majority of people tend to think most. They think in terms of, do I like that? Do I not like that? And there's a subset of people on every team who think the way you were describing Judea Pearl and these other, you know, people want the Bayesian reasoning. They want the logical models of things, right? And then there's a subset of people who are the innovators who really are um, you know, the artisans and they really want to, um, disrupt the system. They're thinking first about what they can create, right? Not about what the rules are. And so you got to bridge those folks and you got to, you, you need, you need all these people on your team, right? There's also an assessment called the Kersey temperament sorter. And I recommend this very strongly. It's a 70 question test you can take for free online at kersey.com, which sorts you into these four types. Um, as Kersey says, um, the psychologist um, in his book, Please Understand Me. Um, you know, a lot of people have taken this. This is an adaptation of the MBTI test, right? Which we all know, right? The Carl Jung adapted Myers Briggs personality to inventory. Oh, yeah. Right? Right. This is an adaptation of Myers Briggs. It's a simplification and it's a valuable one because it allows you to just think of these four types in your head, not the 16 types of Myers Briggs, right? So in Kersey's model, you know, the guardians are fighting the artisans. The guardians are thinking about what's right. The artisans, whatever works. The idealists, what should be, are fighting the rationals, what needs fixing. And the folks who are in the rational often are thinking about the preventable. So in our community, we have the existential risk folks, right? And then we have the guardians who are looking for like protecting uh status quo or protecting kind of uh, finding out what's right discovering the laws of the universe right so many of our many of our group are, are rational guardians kersey says we all blend all of these but often there's one or two that are are more dominant in the way we think and what he tries to get people to realize is that they're all important we all use all four of these corners at different times but you can easily on a small team identify people who think much more in one and realize that they're all going to conflict with each other a little bit. The fundamental confliction or conflict is between the guardians and the ration and the artisans. And then this higher order conflict is idealist rational. That's the one we, we, we tend to value most more. We do more conflict in that space, but we really have to do the bottom ones well to do the top ones. Well, that's the idea. That's why this is a, this why, that's why, that's why you know, in my Evo Devo model, we, we, we put these on a pyramid like this, right? 
Another person who's done this is uh, John Benedict Steenkamp in his leadership book, Time to Lead. And he uses these lovely terms, um, fox, hedgehog, and eagle to describe the types of leaders that we have in many of our organizations. So a hedgehog is a leader who kind of relates everything to a single vision and they try and optimize around it. And that's the fox and hedgehog personality um, uh, model of Isaiah Berlin from the 1960s, right? The fox is the opposite of that. They see lots of options and they're pursuing many ends and you can't really know what their overarching goal is. They may have many, right? And we know people who have this fox personality or this hedgehog personality. And then the eagles are kind of a combination. They try and integrate the two and they try and take a bigger picture. They try and make those two groups kind of work together, right? So they're, they're more natural leaders, marketers, um, managers, uh, strategists, because uh, they take that, try and take that bigger picture. Um, and then he talks about ostrich leaders. There's a number of people who just run away from complexity. It's just too complicated. So they just, they just put their head in the sand. And he, he describes in this book that you can, you can be any of these three types and you can be a great leader if you value the others. Even ostriches can be great leaders if they delegate their foresight um, work to the to one of uh, a person with the, one of the other types, and that really does make sense. You, you know, there's a it's well known that in many big organizations um, there's no there's no thought leadership or results leadership happening from your CEO. They are instead people developers. So they have people leadership and ethical leadership. Those are the four types. They, they care about the ethics and the people and they delegate thought leadership and results leadership to other leaders in their organization, to their deputies, right? And that's a really interesting model. It helps us understand that that's kind of you know, what you have to do is things get more complicated. You have to rely on a network of other people who have different perspectives and, and skills than you. So he, here's a list of various foresight methods that you've probably heard of when you hear about uh, how foresight is produced. And you can see how we kind of divide them up. And we all basically say, you know, they're all important, right? If you don't have people who are doing all of it, uh, working, working all corners of this pyramid, then you're going to get bit by the future, right? And so how do we do foresight? The simplification is we ask what the, what's likely to happen and what could happen, the expected versus the uncertain future. And we may have some fights around that. Then we create, and that's assessing our environment. And that's predictive contrasting. Then we create strategy with sentiment contrasting. And we're going to have some fights around that. What do we want and what must we prevent? right? The preferable and the preventable. And you can ask yourself, which of these two conflicts do we, do we value more? Most of us tend to value the second one more, and we don't think enough about the first one. In fact, many people don't even think the future is predictable. What I was describing in, the, in my opening about accelerating change, many people do not think that that's predictable. They think it's got to stop at some point, because most natural systems are on an S-curve. How can things keep accelerating? Well, they can only do that if they can continue to dive further into this inner space, right? If we can continue to make things at smaller and smaller scales of complexity that don't require the resources of outer space. That's one way that that happens, right? And of course, that they can get smarter. If, if these leading systems are naturally getting smarter, then they're going to keep discovering more of these solutions that keep us on this curve of you know, going from meso to nano to uh, pico to femto technology, to use the terms that, uh, you know, some of our, uh, some of the futurists in our community, uh, like Hugo de Garris, uh, like to write about, right? Okay. So in, In this world we're in, we're seeing these astonishing gains, right? These superstar, used to be called unicorn companies, and now they're super, now we call them superstar stocks and superstar companies. And, uh, you know, 
look at look at the changes. This is not the kind of three percent growth of GDP that we've seen historically. Um, you know, in the last 100 years or the last 50 years in the American economy, right? This is, this is special. These are accelerating networks, as Tom Friedman describes in his book, Thank You for Being Late. Once the iPhone emerged in 2008, we just saw this blow up of scale of applying software uh, solutions and virtualizing many, many physical things, right? And that's going to continue until the whole network is covered. <laughs> right now, many parts of the earth don't have this. So these kinds of growths, it's reasonable to expect them to continue. And so how do you harness that for personal investment? And let's talk a minute about personal uh, investing foresight, right? Um, you can you can get some kind of a retirement account that's tax sheltered and you can put your money into some of these technology companies and you invest in what are called growth stocks, right? And Warren Buffett calls this a snowball, the miracle of compound interest. We've heard this term before, right? And we're expon we're, we don't think exponentially, we tend to think roughly linear linearly. So if you do this IRA calculator, you say, okay, I'm going to put away $6,000 a year. In America, we can put away um, $6,000 a year in a called a Roth IRA. So it's protected. It's one of the IRA accounts. In, in Australia, you have the super, right? The superannuation fund, yeah. right? So you put, a, you put some money into one of these retirement accounts that is tax sheltered. And the 10-year trailing market return for the U.S. stock market is 15%. Think about that. It was previously 9%. I'm arguing that that's a virtualization. It's a dematerialization and densification in the terms that I use it for, uh, in my book. That's just going to continue to happen until uh, you know, the network's fully across the planet. And we're in the very earliest stages of AI and, and network um, uh, growth, right? And so you put aside the 6,000 a year and you get your 15% return. When does that outcompete your salary? Well, this nerd wallet calculator, you can do this, the link's at the bottom. And what do you get at 59 and a half when you can take it all tax-free or 59? Well, look what you get, man, <laughs> $36 million, assuming the 15% um, the return. Isn't that unbelievable? It it's unbelievable, isn't it? That's the kind of growth you get with exponentials, right? So the first, it doesn't look very significant for the first 10 years or 15 years. The blow up's always the second 15 years, right? So you under, you under predict what you're gonna get in the first half of an exponential and you or over predict and you under predict what you're gonna get in the second half. And so, I want, to, I want to mention that, and I want to mention for the Americans in this audience, the custodial Roth. In America, you can open a Roth for your kids as soon as you're paying them an allowance. So my child's going to be, my, my six-year-old, when she turns eight, uh, I'm going to use either Fidelity or Schwab, and I'm going to open a custodial Roth. And that means I'm going to start her on her snowball 10 years earlier than the average American, right? If the average American starts at 18, I'll be able to start her at eight. Right. And that means her investing income is going to outcompete her salary. Um, I think I did the calculation. It's going to be by the time she turns, yeah, there it is, by the time she turns 30. So, unless she's an entrepreneur, uh, you know, in some tech growth company, um, a CEO, right, with, or someone with massive stock. She's going to get financial independence if you define it at three thousand a year, three hundred thousand a year. Uh, the start of her fourth decade of life, right? That's amazing. That's amazing, and that's the nature of this accelerating world that we're in. If you recognize that, you start to put some money aside now, and you learn. I have to learn how to save, right? And there's some very good books in my, I have a four pages on inv investing uh, in my, five, five pages in my book on, on uh, that reference all these books that will help you with the psychology of investing and the habits of investing. 
you have to understand the snowball because this is going to continue. And I'll give you one example of a company that I really like. Uh, that's an example of what's coming or these accelerating networks. This is an air taxi company. Uh, there's three that are public on the public market right now. Uh, this one is called Joby. And they have solved the problem of congestion, the future of congestion in cities. They have an air taxi that carries four people plus a pilot. And it goes 200 miles an hour. It's all electric. Vertical takeoff and landing. It's 80 times quieter than a helicopter. So it can land anywhere in any, you know, any of the uh, built up areas. And it has triple redundancy in case there's a powertrain failure. So it's incredibly safe. And you know, it's an, it's an on-demand Uber network, right? So they're gonna open in two years from now. You can buy them now and have to do a long-term hold because the stock value is not gonna go up until they're FAA approved. And that's gonna be a little more than a year from now if, if, if they're lucky. And then the year after that, 2024, they're launching in four US cities. Now, my belief is this thing's gonna explode because like one of their plans is JFK to downtown Manhattan, right? So that's gonna be 12 minutes from JFK airport to downtown Manhattan. And it's gonna cost something around, uh, around $80 a passenger, right? So you land in the airport, you get to your destination and, um, and it's affordable, right? It's Uber black priced basically. Uh, Uber Elevate sold their um, air taxi um, division to Joby because they realized it was cost too much money to make these. Joby's gonna partner with Toyota to make them. Uh, and Joby has de-risked their FAA strategy because they're, they're uh, gonna sell these to the US Air Force. The Air Force has one of their airframes right now. In case the FAA doesn't approve them in time, they'll start selling to military right away. And they're launching in Korea right now. So in Seoul, they wanna be operating the same time as they operate in the United States. So uh, perhaps finally we'll have the flying cars. You will. It's not like everybody will have one. It's not like you can own one of these. They have to be operated well, by um, an, a certified company with trained license holders for these particular types of aerial craft. Well, right. I think um, what you do is you have to think about you have to think about uh, economics of scale, right? So, uh, Joby, uh, the CEO, he wants to make this as cheap as a dollar a passenger mile. So you want to get across the city, 20 miles is 20 bucks, right? And so there'll be large numbers of these up in the air. You're not going to hear them. They're going to be safe. They're going to be most, they're going to have pilots for at least the next 25 years. But the pilot's just going to be an AI, an AI assist person who's there to pull the whole drone parachute if everything goes south or, uh, you know, um, emergency land, right? Mostly the AI is guiding them and keeping them in their lanes, right? And so the scale, the scale can be there, right? There's, there's currently 40 lanes that are allowed, like a 40 decker freeway above the cities current, by in current FAA, it's called highway in the sky between high enough to you can't hear them to where the jets, where, where the uh, commercial jets fly. There's probably gonna, they're gonna probably split that into 80 lanes because these things can fly incredible precision. If you've ever seen a drone in the air, they fly in all weather, they have LIDAR and radar so they can see through fog and clouds and rain. They're never gonna hit a goose. They're never gonna hit another person, uh, an another uh, aircraft, right? So if you think about, do you think about this, the problems for solving scale, they've pretty much solved every single one you can imagine. And your personal ownership problem, uh, there's a good path for that future of that too. Um, they're gonna sell them, to people, they're current. They're, they're currently 1.3 million a piece, but they're gonna, you know, they're gonna become much cheaper. And there's a model. There's a version of this uh, where um, you actually have a pod, and the the thing just comes and picks up your pod, and your pod is is uh, is what you have at your home or on your ranch, 
And um, you just get in your pod, you load your luggage in and you wait and the thing comes and grabs you. And the pod model is actually the throughput that can happen with that is just significantly higher, a swappable pod than, uh, than actually having a, 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 an air taxi that you have to own and, and upkeep, right? So at a certain point, you get your flying car, but you get it in a different way than you necessarily thought you'd get it, right? I mean, like, it, it sounds interesting. Uh, of course, the, the, you sound very optimistic about this particular technology. Um, well, I've invested, I, I, I'd, I've I'd invested like, in I know that. Yes. I know that. I, I, I'd like to know um, when they can actually show the proof of, and, and, and test all this so that it's working beyond demo level. Because I yes. think with a lot of um, artificial neural networks, they're not quite... Um, adept at working in very well in physical environments where the landscape is continuous. And so although you can, you can get really good demos, you can show proof that it can work. Um, sometimes there's this, you know, there's always going to be like that, those 1% of times where they don't, and when they don't, they fail catastrophically or fail outside. That's a great outside. point. Okay. So and that's look, an, and so that's we an, don't have yeah. self-driving cars yeah. No, that is an on excellent the road. point, Adam, and that is why that is why I didn't invest. That's why I invested in Joby rather than say Kitty Hawk. So there's several of these companies that are trying the autonomy approach that you mentioned, and like you, I'm an actual pessimist on the autonomy uh, approach. Uh, I believe Joby wants to have seats, have humans who are making all the decisions, and just have the AI just as assist. It's backup. It's lane keeping, the way it's used on say a commercial jetliner today. So there's different think, ways of categorizing. This is like on the loop or in the loop are you talking about? And then there's uh, out of the loop, which is not what we're talking about here. Are, are humans right. in the loop or are they just sort of on the loop and just monitoring what AI is doing and occasionally intervening when the need? Comes? How would you define um, a, a Tesla autopilot? Would you define that as on the loop? when you have it engaged or when you have adaptive cruise, con cruise control engaged? If you well, define... I'd say that's probably probably in the loop because um, although it's say it stages, look, I don't know. I'm not that familiar with this yep. technology that Tesla uses. Yep. I don't have a Tesla, but cruise right. control, um, you can yep. have that running on an open road, but yep. um, you know, and, and it can tell how far, you are from the pre the vehicle in front of you and all that sort of stuff. That's fine. Right. And yeah. it does some amount of steering for you, but you're in yeah. the loop and you can immediately take control when need to be, when you need to. And that's not like you I just think... press a button to do that. You yeah. still got a steering wheel and an accelerator right. pedal. Um, yeah. On the loop, I think is being so abstract. All you need to do is just like press a button or, 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 or um, send some programming commands and it'll change strategy. Yeah, those are levels of those are levels of I would call them philosophical detail around the operations that I don't find as valuable as the for me as the just the more general question of uh, you know do you need a person in the in the vehicle making decisions with AI assist and figure out the types of AI assist or not and so I think the approach where it's all autonomy uh, that's not going to be politically or socially very well accepted. Uh, they, and I think they're gonna require a much higher uh, testing around the edge cases that you were describing before it's released. That's why I really like the Joby approach as opposed to Kitty Hawks because they're not doing that. They're, it's full pilot control for, uh, you know, they're visioning at least 20 years. They have this huge pilot training program they just started. So they want humans in the seat making the decisions and as it scales, the AI will help the scaling better and better. And yeah, there'll be mistakes, but the question is, can you deliver this for a dollar a passenger mile? If you can, everybody's gonna say, oh, that's awesome, I want that. And assuming they're safe too. So yeah. Well, that's right, I mean, like the difference between yeah. stalling on the ground and having a crash on the ground or something going wrong on the ground is that you don't have that far to fall. Right. Yeah, those are all really important points. And, uh, you know, we did a nice little deep dive rabbit hole on this. I think it's... it's I think it's I fascinating. Think our viewers, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yep, I, I, I think our viewers... I, I, I'm should, a bit skeptical. <laughs> I think yeah. you should be. I think you should be. Maybe I only, I'm one of those pessimistic guardian types. <laughs> I think on this particular one, you are. And that's good. That's great. And it's good. If we recognize that, 
we have better conversations. That's, my, that's the whole idea about foresight, right? If we actually are willing to trust each other to say what we don't like and not make each other wrong, right? We will find. Right, yeah, yeah. So we'll uh, get from the, data. the perspective of well, I come from a, an IT background, and you know I've yep. been doing a lot of sort of pro- process organization, and yep. um, what I'm always trying to do is I, when I go into a contracted new organization, I find that sometimes their models or their whole architecture is really messy, um, yeah. and it's fragile, and things go wrong all the time. And what they're yeah. really doing is they're focusing on outcome behavioralistic outcomes new features um and yes. they, they they've got uh they're, they're and they're not very fault tolerant because uh, they've got huge huge it t- teams just chasing up bugs and and chasing up things where you know something goes down it's it's like and it's not very easy for one person or even a team of people to understand yes it's so you've, you've soft you've given me a softball um intro to this issue of ai you know, um, AI before 2010 used to be that kind of AI, very brittle. And then the deep learning stuff emerged. And now it became a different paradigm. It's more about training. It's more about the appropriateness of the data sets, the completeness of them. And so there's much more of a, there's much more of a fault tolerant statistical uh, failure and adaptiveness. And uh, my argument is you just got to have a lot more of that. You got to get systems much more like these systems. You have to really add more and more of that biological approach because we are fully fault tolerant not fully but we are very fault tolerant in that sense in in the way our our brains work and that's really helpful um i as i was saying i think one of the most important fault tolerance is what do you do when your logic doesn't guide you you may have know damasio's um descartes error by antonio damasio where people who have their limbic circuits broken right? Lesions in the amygdala, for example, and they can't, they don't have access to their gut feelings. They are perfect logical paralysis machines. They will argue forever about the positives and negatives of something, and they can't make a decision. So you have to have in in all the cases, the vast majority of cases where we can't optimize, we don't have, you know, Judea Pearl's causal, full causal model. You got to have gut instinct. And we have to learn how to put that into our AIs. And we're, I would argue, decades away still from that, which is why I believe the, the, you know, the singularity, the general AI um, uh, technological singularity is, is um, in the second half of this century. It's not Kurzweil's, you know, 2030 or 20 or Vinci's 2030 or Kurzweil's 2040. I think it's going to be significantly further out than we think. And because there's a lot more complexity, we are not modeling, but we can, start to argue about what kinds we need and you know we well, we well i mean uh, the deep learning models you you mentioned i mean they've been able to do amazing things i mean yes i've looked at them the text generation for instance yes it, it yes. is incredible um and yes. you know you, you you give it some input and it'll it basically has mined the whole internet or most of the internet wikipedia and and i guess there might be some categorization behind the scenes i don't know but it's it, it seems to be able to through predictive processing through finding massive correlations across big data it's able to produce amazing things i mean yes. like it's incredible but they don't use that in chatbots in industry now because it's not dependable i mean these Things may be able to produce really interesting and great output, but it's it's it, it fails enough for it not to be dependable, um, yes. for for us not to trust it enough yet. Because all of a sudden it can go ultra postmodernist and start talking about something completely different, or get you know really abstract and obscure yes. and Dali esque, right? It, yep. But fascinating and, and, and fun to talk to, but not necessarily helpful, <laughs> right? But um, what's the problem there? We can't see what's going inside these models because they're completely opaque. Um, yeah. We don't know. Like they, we don't know. Uh, they they build the neural nets, build these models, and they're really difficult to understand. Um, yes. and that's why I argue uh, a next big phase shift in in um, artificial intelligence could be the online learning of causal models because correlation isn't causation. Um, mm-hmm. but, but I think 
the problems are being worked on uh, at the moment and there is progress. It's just there's not enough progress for really us to see um, huge demos of these things working yet. But um, maybe in the next 10 years, that's what Ju Judea Pearl thinks. Um, yeah, it's I think definitely what worth you, you were saying that. sounds, mm -hmm. yes, what you were saying sounds similar to what um, Pedro Domingo says in the book, The Master Algorithm, where he talks about the various uh, five camps of AI. And when he argued in, in his his critique of the neural network approach and the deep learning approach is, you know, they don't do compositional logic. They can't do chains, logical chains of reasoning. And so if you can't do that with these amazing pattern recognizers, then you are a long way still from this, these causal models that you're describing. And I totally agree with you. That's going to be important. In my understanding of neuroscience, however, it's that's just, you know, I mean, that's part of your executive function in your forebrain, but you've got so many other areas of your brain that have to integrate things. And I, I believe that's going to be huge. Maybe it'll be, you know, who knows, twice as impactful as what setting up a basic uh, neural net deep learning system with the various kinds of, you know, convolution, convolutional and other training that they've done. You know, your model, your thing could like triple the power of AI, but I think you got all these other pieces that you're going to have to add on to, and and, and it has to be a in a selection oh, yeah. environment, a right. selection environment, right, where the system can just like biological systems, um, the system can be selected for proven past safe behavior. And my best example is domesticated animals, you know, dingoes and and hyenas you can't trust with small children today because they're not domesticated dogs. Every other species, every species of dog that has been domesticated, we can leave the room with small children. We did not design their brains. All we did is we did 10,000 years or in many cases, much less of selection for symbiosis. And we let the ones that had proven past safe behavior replicate and we put down the ones that didn't. And that is, I think the way you get, let's, I call that natural security. Right. You have yeah. To, if natural. If natural but, intelligence is required, if 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 the only way through to to artificial intelligence is natural intelligence, it's possible. The only way through to 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 real security, once you have large numbers of these being selected all the time, is this natural security approach where we are uh, where selection and the testing environment becomes a critical part of how the systems self improve because we're not we're not designing anymore as you say once they get to that stage where they have they have a set of parameters you probably heard of uh, of these um, uh, hardware description language parameters that can unfold a neural network you can think of those like genes and that those things can start to randomize and then unfold the network and then it gets trained upon well how do you trust it you trust it by this large, but this great selection environment, maybe a lot of simulated, a lot of selection and simulations. Uh, but again, selection it has to be selection. And then you get the proven past safe behavior. I, like I wonder to talk if you can get both selection and intelligibility because we can't see inside like an animal's brain or humans, human brains very well yet. And we can't like predict what they're going to do. So okay. sometimes when we leave a dog in the room with a child, the dog might attack the child. I've seen um, people with scars on their face because of dog bites. Yeah. Um, yeah. They don't, and, they don't, they don't kill it though. Yeah. I mean, to take that analogy and be fine with it, all the domesticated well, well, animals. Can I, yeah, yeah. So, so let me just suggest that sometimes humans have a problem and they do go out and like get a machine gun and do something really nasty or, exactly. they, or you know, they don't have access to like a, um, a machine gun or a knife, but they, they still f figure out a way to do something nasty. Humans yes. can fail. Um, humans aren't always, you know, the, uh, the ideal creature that we'd like to believe that we are. Yes. Um, and so th there are faults that they, these think we have, but like, I'm wondering whether we can uh, have both this, we, we can train AI in a selective environment but at, at the same time have an ai that's not so ob, um obscure and obtuse just uh so difficult so, to understand so intelligibility down, of how it's it really important the, don't you think i think it comes down to the level 
of transparency that you are looking for. Uh, there is going to be a certain irreducible obscurity. For us, it would be our free will, our, our free will generating mechanisms, I would argue, are irreducibly obscure. And they're going to be irreducibly obscure to the AI itself. Is it's going to have these features internal that's generating complexity that it can it can only broadly understand. It can only understand them in these evolutionary, combinatorial, and developmental constraint models. It can't under it can't predict them just like we can't self-predict where my hand is going to go next. There's some kind of generators in there that give me that freedom in many cases. So I would say at certain level, maybe it, you know, it depends how you want fine grained you want to get. Maybe the future neural, maybe the future AI engineers are going to understand the parameters. They're going to have some sense of the gene of how the genes interact, and and they're of course going to have a lot of sense of beha behaviorally, right? Which is where well, how we I open mean, this. We, okay, so yeah. so we can have both behaviorally, and we can also make predictions. We can actually um, sort of scan a human brain if there's a lesion in a certain area of the human brain. We can make some predictions about the type yes. of. Uh, yeah. behavioral, um, I guess, influences that legion yes. might have, right. um, you know, if there's a, a cancer in um, the, you know, the visual cortex area, we might predict that the person might go blind or, or, or might not be able to um, see as well um, as in the past. I guess the idea is where does this um, irreducible complexity lie? Where, where, how far can we push that back? So, that um, if we're going to have these like superhuman AIs, these incredibly powerful AIs, yeah. um, how much transparency can we get to make sure so that I they think don't? Yep, I think what we're they, asking they veer off in, in the wrong direction and don't do I something. Think what we're asking is a question about catastrophically or. I think what we're asking is a question about the uh, two questions. Then uh, we're asking a question about the 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 intrinsic predictable predictability of complex adaptive systems as they scale far into the future. And we're asking the intrinsic trustability. Now you mentioned explainability, which is a huge new field in AI, you know, having the neural network be able to explain, show you what its model is. And you can say, well, uh, you know, I don't like that, that feature, that's not actually a cat. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix that. But the AI needs to be able to explain, particularly when it's making life or death decisions, what its model is. And, I, and yes, we'll get to that level of transparency and probably much, much more. What I'm arguing is though, though, is that if these systems are evolutionary and developmental, if they truly are like, like biological systems, then the more we understand, yes, you can predict the past simpler systems. There's people trying to predict in real time, you know, how bacterial gene protein regulatory networks work. Eventually with quantum, you know, probably quantum you know, simulation will be able to do that very high level, even with, you know, all the random motion that's going on inside of the cell with enough sensors, just like we're predicting the weather 10 days out now. But that's just the bacteria. The, the things that are in the leading edge of complexity, including their networks, how they interact, I would argue that will always have so many combinatorial capabilities relative to the finite you know, I call it the incompleteness. I call it the computational incompleteness. And that's not, that, unfortunately, that's my, my own term for it. I'm sure there are terms in information and computability theory that, are, that describe it better. But the argument is that we're all these finite state machines in this incredibly complex uh, world with many, many possibilities. And we're never going to be omniscient or omnipotent. So I think we have to use the models that nature has shown work so far and that's the bottleneck we're going to have to go through that and so that that's why i buy this argument that kurzweil says that when the ais wake up they're going to have religion right they're going to they're going to have well spiritual beliefs things they cannot predict but they think are valuable about the much larger network the whole universe which is in my view creating this accelerating complexity on all earth likes it's a developmental process and so they're going to have some unprovable beliefs about that, some spiritual. And if they if they all agree on some of those, then they're going to have spiritual communities kind of arguing the stuff just like you and I are. So to me, that's stuff that's beyond the predictable and verifiable. 
and that that always exists at the leading edge because the most the organisms that allow that level of unpredictability, they just outcompete all the others, in my view. Yes, past predictability, transparency can go very high, but if this is an accelerating complexification that we're all stuck in, then it's possible that the leading edge systems, they're gonna to have to use natural intelligence and natural security the way we have. So that's my, well, I, that's I my don't assumption. Think, I don't think transparency and um, I guess predictability or that, you know, working in a sort of an evolutionary fa- framework have to be enemies here. Um, I, I know that there's gonna be trade-offs on one side or the other. Um, you know, in order to get stuff to work and, and to get it to work in a timely manner. But um, it does seem to me as though if we can't explain why the systems are working the way that they do, we can't explain the models that they generate. Um, we also can't tell when they'll fail um, or how fragile they'll be in that's in true. An un- but you just in came back to circumstance. So yeah, that's I think true. It's, but you I think just that- came back to but you just came back to what I was saying about um, about domestic animals and what you were saying about humans. There will yeah, always right. be. So, so statistical... but the thing is, if yeah. if what we're doing is we're developing really uh, powerful AI, uh, we we're going to put a, an amount of trust in them to uh, to do things that we don't put just one person or an animal in charge of. Yes. Um, we we you know we we want these things to do things that we can't do. Um, yes. And 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 you know and so if we. I guess if, if we learn dependency on these systems without understanding what they're doing, um, then we're not going right. to be able to tell when they'll fail or when yes. they're reaching the edges of their competence. And well, if the maybe, way that they'll maybe, fail will be catastrophic, um, maybe, how do we achieve graceful degradation in systems like this without understanding what's really going on inside? Well, them? I believe we can measure, we can, we can take those terms like graceful degradation and we can measure them and we can test them in the individuals and in the networks. And my argument would be that it'll be a network, it'll be a community of these systems that are gonna be the most uh, fault tolerant and the most adaptable. And so I would argue there will be these, there's gonna be these continual failures. And if we build the network well, then the system the network itself will police its own bad actors the way we do in our own society. Yeah, yeah, Steve Armando. Um... I think he's also an advocate of the community of AI approach. And we, you know, we're still early in figuring out this question of what are the fundamental assumptions, right? Mm, mm. Are, that, I guess that, we, that... we should be putting all our eggs in one basket. That's what I'm saying here. I Good. think we should continue on with the Evo Devo approach. And I think that can inform developments really in, in AI. And I mean, we've got so much to thankful, thank for the, um, the, 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 the cognitive, uh, the cognitively uh, informed approach to develop deep neural nets. They can do amazing things, but I also think that we can um, on at the same time try and develop the uh, the causal representation learning further and, 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 and test to see how well it does. I mean, I don't think anybody can really argue against trying multiple approaches to see which ones work in the future yes. um, and which ones are more fault tolerant, safe, uh, where, where the right trade-off between safety and, um, and uh, capability lies. It's just, uh, it's, it's going to be difficult if... Um, if what we're doing was we're using a market with all these competitive paradigms uh, there that that influence people to just get the the first thing that works out the door as quickly as possible, so as to gain dominance in the marketplace, I'm worried about that. As well. It's a good so. worry, and as an invaluable, that's a very good dystopia to be defensively pessimistic about. <laughs> and so, thank you. Uh, you know. It's really great and refreshing to have these conversations because we don't necessarily get to do this nearly enough. Mm. And, uh, you know, the best we can do is we can just keep having them and trying to reference some touchstones. You know, I would recommend the master algorithm, which talks about what's limiting currently of these with these neural networks. And yeah, uh, give Martin, read, Ford, for sure. Mar- Martin Ford's book, Architects of Intelligence, is a very mm. nice summary of the various bets people are making in the AI space. And if you want to read more about this natural intelligence model that I'm suggesting, you know, my book, start there and follow on to this. And hopefully that's helpful. And let's keep having the conversation, buddy. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, um, I'm looking looking forward to the up and coming conference in late April, which is um, one and a half or close to two months away from now. So um, I'll most likely see you there, John. Thanks everybody for tuning in. I really appreciate spending the time to uh, listen to these, uh, to this, to John's talk and our discussion afterwards. And um, if you like this, please subscribe and mention it to your friends. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. John. Yeah. Been awesome Take chatting. Care. Yeah. Awesome. Cheers, man. Bye. Cheers, buddy.